This week's episode is brought to you by Audible, and I am once again here to tell you about another podcast that you might like, an Audible original called Fiasco. Fiasco is a documentary-style podcast hosted by Leon Nafok, the co-creator and original host of Slowburn. If you like the classic seasons Leon and his team made about Watergate and the Clinton impeachment, then you'll love Fiasco. Each season, Fiasco goes deep on a huge, important issue from American history and brings it back to life through original interviews with key players and witnesses. The newest season of Fiasco is all about the AIDS crisis. It's an attempt to re-examine and reckon with the last time a deadly virus transformed American society and all the uncertainty, fear, and prejudice that came with it. You can listen to the new season of Fiasco now exclusively on Audible. Just go to audible.com slash Fiasco Pod or text Fiasco Pod to 500 500. That again, Fiasco Pod 500 500. Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 10.98 The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Today, we are going to talk about Russia's place in the world now that we are transitioning out of the Schrodinger's revolution phase, where it wasn't clear who or what was going to step out of the box. Now that we know the answer to that question, we have further questions. How would the communist government in Moscow relate to the former constituent parts of the Russian Empire? How would they relate to the other factions, branches, and parties of the international socialist movement, which the victorious Russian communists, by virtue of their victory, fully expected to lead? How would they relate to the other great European powers? Despite major ideological divides, both sides now had to reckon with the reality that the other was here to stay. In terms of foreign affairs, the minimum program for Soviet Russia was, as always, to simply survive in a world they viewed as implacably and permanently hostile. But they also gave as good as they got in terms of implacable and permanent hostility to ideological enemies, and so the maximum program for Soviet Russia remained the same program that had been on the table since our very first episode of this series, when the first international gathered in London in 1864. Global Socialist Revolution. So we'll start today with the question of how Russia proper would relate to the former constituent parts of the old Russian Empire. We know that places like Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and western chunks of both Belarus and Ukraine are, for the moment, truly independent entities, recognized as such by Moscow and not yet simply puppet regimes. But as we discussed a few episodes back, the Red Victory in the Russian Civil War meant that the rest of the old Russian Empire was left pretty much intact. The communists reorganized these territories as a mixed bag of SSRs, SFSRs, and ASSRs. Some were officially subordinate to Moscow, others technically sovereign and independent. For Lenin and the other members of the inner circle of the Russian Communist Party, making permanent sense of all this seemed to point them in one of two directions— Either take all these territories and truly unite them in a single integrated and centralized sovereign entity, or merely band them together in a loose confederation of independent republics, joined by treaties of alliance, but who otherwise could not and would not tell each other what to do. It was, not for nothing, a very similar question the leaders of the newborn United States faced in the 1780s, after they emerged victorious from their revolution. There were good arguments to be made on both sides, and as you can imagine, there was tension between the hardline Russian communists, who habitually favored the Bolshevik virtues of centralized decision-making and unified discipline, and, say, leaders of the Ukrainian Communist Party or the Georgian Communist Party, who wanted the right to act freely inside their own territories. The years of civil war and the experience of gaining, losing, and then regaining control of these various territories had taught Lenin in the inner circle of the party to be wary of both heavy-handed centralization, which had so often backfired, but also just hands-off independence to leave people to do what they wanted to do. That would leave everyone too divided and vulnerable to the enemies of the revolution. At the 10th Party Congress in March 1921, the same one that had kicked off the NEP and introduced the ban on factions, the party created a commission to study how best to integrate the huge geographic area inside the Soviet orbit 
along with its vast regional, linguistic, religious, cultural, and ethnic differences. Now, just before the 10th Party Congress, Comrade Stalin, in his capacity as Commissar of Nationalities, made it clear that in his view the party must push for integration and unification of all these territories. Stalin argued, Not one Soviet republic taken separately can consider itself safe from economic exhaustion and military defeat by world imperialism. Therefore, the isolated existence of separate Soviet republics has no firm basis in view of the threats to their existence from the capitalist states. The national Soviet republics that have freed themselves from their own and from the foreign bourgeoisie will be able to defend their existence and conquer the united forces of imperialism only by joining in a close political union. In other words, Stalin is here channeling his inner Ben Franklin and saying to everyone, join or die. And, not unlike Franklin's vision for the United States, Stalin expected the integrated political, economic, and military systems of a hypothetical Union of Soviets to involve a great deal of regional autonomy for local leaders in the Union's constituent parts, a federalized balance of central power and local controls. By the end of 1921, though, the arguments over whether to integrate, federalize, or have everybody declare independence from everybody else were entirely confined to the members of the Communist Party. Political alternatives to the party could not be tolerated, and so as a matter of deliberate policy, all the other parties out there, be they socialist, anarchist, nationalist, liberal, or conservative, were broken, repressed, persecuted, imprisoned, or exiled. We saw this last week with the trial of the SRs, but I want to take a moment now to talk about Ukraine and close the book on Nestor Makhno, because when the leaders of Ukraine and Russia get to arguing about how and when and where to integrate with each other, the Ukrainian anarchist movement was as exhausted and broken as Nestor Makhno himself. As we've seen, the Reds and the Blacks in Ukraine had been formal allies off and on throughout the Civil War up through the final battles against General Vrongil in Crimea in late 1920. Makhno's forces had fought on the front lines of that campaign, but even before it was over, both the Reds and the Blacks positioned themselves to knife each other in the back as soon as they combined to defeat the Whites. Orders had been issued from Moscow to Red Army officers in the area that as soon as Vrongil was beat, that they liquidate the Black Army. The Cheka had already tried and failed to assassinate Makhno, so when orders said liquidate, they meant liquidate. They didn't mean send him home and give him a nice pension. Makhno himself never had any intention of laying down his arms and letting the Russian communists take over Ukraine. So, after Vrongil was defeated, the Reds and the Blacks turned on each other almost immediately. Red Cossack divisions chased Makhno all over Ukraine during the winter of 1920-1921, but he successfully evaded their pursuit. When the Kronstadt Rebellion hit in March 1921, Makhno tried to fan the flame of a general anti-communist uprising in Ukraine, but by now the old insurrectionary energy was exhausted from years of constant civil war and rebellion. Still leading a couple thousand loyal partisans, Makhno found his supplies and ammunition depleted, most of his most dedicated fighters dead and buried, and potential new recruits far less enthusiastic about taking up arms. Especially, as Lenin had demanded communists that were consolidating their hold in Ukraine to check their Russian chauvinism at the door this time. With steam running out of the black movement, Makhno also had to reckon with his own body. Always leading from the front lines, he had been badly wounded several times, most recently in the stomach. By the summer of 1921, the man who had personally led so many charges on horseback was a wounded invalid who had to be carried around by his bodyguards. Unable to risk going to a proper hospital, and with the prospects for immediate victory against the entrenching communists now dim, Makhno, his wife, and about a hundred loyalists decided to break for the relative safety of Poland, where they would seek temporary asylum, and most importantly, access to real doctors. But as Makhno and his comrades booked it west, the Red Army caught their scent. In a fierce firefight in late August, most of Makhno's entourage were killed, and he himself took a somehow non-fatal bullet to the neck. Unable to reach Poland, he had to turn and head for Romania. In early September 1921, he and the last of his followers took down a Red Army checkpoint and crossed the border. The intention was always to come back to Ukraine, but he would never come back. 
and when he departed, the Macnovis dream of a black Ukraine quietly died. Ernesto Magno spent the rest of his life in exile, first in Romania for a year before he snuck over into Poland, where he was apprehended and placed in an internment camp in April 1922. Allowed to stay, he got caught up in what appears to have been a Soviet operation to deliberately lure him into a position that compromised his standing with the Polish government, and so they threw him in prison for a year. In prison, his health continued to deteriorate, and the tuberculosis he had long ago contracted was exacerbated. Despairing of everything, Macneau drafted some memoirs in prison and then attempted suicide in April 1924. But he didn't die, and instead he recovered and was allowed to move to Danzig, where he dodged a Russian attempt to kidnap him, then got arrested by local authorities again, and escaped from a German prison. By 1925, he had made his way to Paris, where he spent the final nine years of his life. This final decade was pretty miserable for Macneau. He struggled to work. He was hobbled by a half-dozen physical disabilities from his years of hard fighting. His mood soured. He separated from his wife. He was alienated from and bickered with former close friends who dropped out of his life one by one. Sinking into terminal poverty, Macneau continued to write articles, defend his revolutionary career, and argue with anyone who was still left to argue with. In the early 1930s, a group of Spanish anarchists who idolized him as an almost mythical figure did their best to support him with a meager pension, but it was never enough. And in July 1934, Nestor Macneau died in Paris of complications from tuberculosis, malnutrition, and that greatest of social diseases, poverty. As I said when we embarked on the Russian Revolution, the story of what happened during these years is not so neat and tidy as the Tsar falls in February, the liberals make a hash of things, and the socialists triumph in October. Because the Bolsheviks were just one revolutionary socialist party among many, and it was only after they won the Civil War that they were able to portray themselves as the true embodiment of socialist revolution, while all these other types, Mensheviks and the various flavors of SR, left and right, populist and terrorist, were sinister or delusional deviationists from the true path. It's hard to even remember that the October Revolution was just one group of socialists attacking another group of socialists, and that Kerensky was an SR, not a cadet. Now, it is time for Nestor Makhno and the Ukrainian anarchists to follow the well-trod path of the other left-wing rivals to Bolshevism, left to memory and history, but leaving a revolutionary spirit of resistance that, obviously, lives on to this day. But just because the Communist Party was making itself synonymous with socialism inside Russia, out in the wider world, they remained just one socialist faction among many. Prior to World War I, all these factions, not counting the anarchists, of course, had been nominally united under the very broad umbrella of the Second International. In 1919, the Russian communists had founded a third international, a communist international, to redefine and reorient worldwide socialism after the obvious abject failures of the Second International. But though the Second International had failed the test of World War I, that did not mean its leading lights were prepared to simply give up their hopes, dreams, and beliefs and convert to Bolshevism. So just before the common turns, First World Congress in March 1919, a group of old social democrats met in Bern, Switzerland. The leading German Marxists, like Karl Kautsky and Edward Bernstein, who disagreed about so much, both urged their comrades to condemn Bolshevism as an unwelcome deviation. This group tried to fully restore the Second International, but by now that brand was way too tarnished. Nearly all the most radical left-wing elements of European socialism had already enthusiastically joined the Comintern, while another group, led by Austrian Marxists like Friedrich Adler and Otto Bauer, tried to find a middle path between the reformist parliamentary socialists and the radical Bolsheviks. In February 1921, they convened in Vienna and founded something called the International Working Union of Socialist Parties, which I should mention included Russian Mensheviks like Julius Martov and Pavel Axelrod. In recognition of their attempt to find common unifying ground between the old Second Internationalists and the new Third Internationalists, this group is colloquially referred to as either the Two and a Half International or the second and a half international. Now, as I briefly mentioned last week, 
these three socialist groups came together in Berlin in April 1922 for the Conference of the Three Internationals. This was sort of the one good faith effort on all their parts to see if there remained enough similarities and agreements to overcome their differences and disagreements. Now, finding this was always going to be tough, as the common turn was always going to insist groups entering its ranks sign pledges of discipline that the social democratic parties were never going to sign, and the social democratic parties were always going to insist on strategies, tactics, and policies the communists believed long since discredited. And frankly, they suspected the social democrats were now working not for socialist revolution, but seducing the workers and the peasants to embrace a kindler, gentler imperialist capitalism. The conference convened on the eve of the trial of the SRs, an obviously controversial development that took up a lot of attention at the conference of the three internationals and which soured relations among them all, especially after social democratic observers returned with tales of absurd and tyrannical show trials, not against kings and capitalists, but against fellow comrades. Some left-wing elements outside the communist orbit tried to maintain the hope of a unified international socialist movement, but the bridges between them all were now burning. At the Fourth World Congress of the Common Turn in November 1922, they rejected a call to join a decentralized and broadly inclusive international socialist group, leaving it to the last rump of the Second International and the leaders of the Two and a Half International to merge with one another, but not with the communists. In May 1923, these more conservative and moderate socialists convened in Hamburg and, recognizing that the Second International was dead and buried, formed a new group called the Labor and Socialist International, or LSI. In contrast to the common turn, there were very few hard rules for membership, and member parties joined as independent organizations, not as disciplined subsets recognizing a centralized authority. And so, International socialism would go marching into the interwar period divided between communists and social democrats, a divide that would have disastrous consequences for them all, as a new movement called fascism stepped into the breach to make their own bid for world power. Beyond the frontiers of the old Russian Empire, and away from the internecine fights of international socialism, the early 1920s also marked a period of tense conciliation between the great powers of Europe, who now represented wildly different ideological worldviews. Immediately after World War I, the Western capitalist powers had obviously tried to overthrow the communist regime, and, in turn, the communists had tried to overthrow all the Western capitalists. But after all that shook out, they now found themselves in the mutually awkward position of cohabitating a game board that neither could win total control of. At the moment, neither side officially recognized the other, leading to one of those recurring absurdities of international diplomacy where governments just shut their eyes real tight and pretend like the other government simply doesn't exist. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was not thrilled about the state of European diplomacy, and so, as we've seen in March 1921, he navigated his way to a British-Soviet trade deal that normalized relationships between the two countries without yet breaking off the magical seal of official recognition. By late 1921, Lloyd George was further troubled by the state of post-World War I Europe and the ongoing ramifications of the incredibly punitive Treaty of Versailles. He lobbied the other great powers to meet in a conference in Genoa in the spring of 1922 for a great reassessment of where they were three years into the Treaty of Versailles era. Controversially, this invitation was extended to both Weimar Germany and Soviet Russia, both of whom had been diplomatically isolated by the victorious allies. Lloyd George hoped this conference would blunt some of the harsher aspects of Versailles, but new French Prime Minister Raymond Poincaré virtually defined his career with hostility to the Germans. In his role as foreign minister during the July crisis, he had been one of the unwitting architects of World War I, Poincaré himself did not attend the Genoa conference, but the French delegation arrived with a brief to allow no let-up on German reparations, and in fact, they were to try to convince the Russians to pursue their own reparations claims against Germany under Article 116 of the Treaty of Versailles. Poincaré's grand vision was to then press French claims to Russian debt contracted by the Tsar that would be paid by these German reparations to Russia. Thus far, the Soviets had refused to recognize or pay those old debts, 
but if the money came from Germany, maybe they'd be willing to just turn around and funnel it to France. All these maneuvers really accomplished, though, was short-circuiting the less punitive peace Lloyd George hoped for, and instead once again unwittingly trigger a nightmare scenario, a Soviet-German Treaty of Friendship. After the Genoa Conference convened on April 10, 1922, the German and Russian delegations met secretly in the nearby resort town of Rapallo, and after several days of negotiations, suddenly emerged with a treaty in hand, much to the shock and horror of the other delegations, especially Britain and France. There was a lot to recommend a German-Soviet agreement at the time. In the new world of the NEP, Russia needed technology, manpower, imports, and industrial expertise that the Germans could provide. And the Germans needed consumer markets and raw materials that the Russians could provide. Germany agreed to abandon all claims to debts taken out by the Tsar, and Russia renounced all reparations claims against Germany under Article 116. And although both sides denied it vehemently, they also signed a secret military treaty, whereby the Russians would house German finance factories that would supply both countries with munitions, as well as establish training bases for German soldiers forbidden to exist in Germany under the terms of the Versailles Treaty. The Russians, for their part, gained access to military academies for their young officers to train them properly, as well as all those munitions coming out of the factories. But one of the biggest things to come out of the Treaty of Rapallo was simply that Germany became the first great power to officially recognize Soviet Russia, paving the way for the other powers to give up and follow suit. Soviet Russia was a thing. The revolution was over. The Russian communists were the last ones still standing, and no one was on the verge of knocking them over. There was no sense in denying it anymore. Soviet Russia was a thing. But I want to end today by advancing beyond merely Soviet Russia, which was now a thing, but it was not the official entity that would be the thing interacting with the other great powers on the world stage in the years and decades to come. For that, we need to turn our attention to the Soviet Union. What is the Soviet Union? What is this entity that emerged from a decade of world war, civil war, and revolution? It was often casually treated in the West as merely synonymous with Russia or the Russians, but the USSR was more complicated than that and it represented a compromise between the two big available options we talked about at the beginning of today's episode, complete consolidation and centralization, or separation, divorce, and mutual independence. In January 1922, Georgi Chicherin, the People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, was about to go off and negotiate the Treaty of Rapallo with his German counterparts, he sent an official inquiry around questioning whether the other SSRs should consider themselves represented on the world stage by him and his team. Effectively, could he represent those other SSRs in his capacity as Commissar of Foreign Affairs for only the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic? And though there was no legal mechanism allowing for this, people like Comrade Stalin said that Russia should represent the other SSRs in foreign affairs, now, this led to discussions and arguments with leaders of the various other SSRs about the feasibility and desirability of creating an official legal union that would formalize all of this, specifically a union of the Ukrainian SSR, the Belarusian SSR, and a brand new thing called the Transcaucasian SSR that was formed in March 1922 from Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. But though the Russian Communist Party leaders were moving decisively towards formal integration of all these SSRs, Lenin in particular continued to be wary of perceived Russian chauvinism. When Stalin came around to discuss all this, Lenin said that the language of having the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic absorb Ukraine, Belarus, and the Transcaucasian states was not going to work. It was unacceptable. They instead must enter into a federal agreement where they would each join as equal members without anyone absorbing anyone else. Lenin said, It is important not to give grist to the mill of the independence lobby, not to destroy their independence, but to create a new level of a federation of equal republics. Stalin made the point that there was a complicating hypocrisy involved here, because, for example, the Bashkir and the Tatars and other nationalities 
would be left in their subordinated ASSR units, not elevated to being full co-equal members of Lenin's proposed union. The difference was justified by nothing but the political and military realities that some of them were well and truly under Russia's thumb, and others were not. Lenin and Stalin also discussed how far this union was expected to go. In Lenin's mind, he envisioned eventually the entire world joining the Soviet Union. SSR states in Poland, Germany, France, and throughout the globe joining together in a single union of Soviet socialist republics. Stalin was far more skeptical that this was possible or even desirable. They couldn't even get Finland and the Baltic states on board. Poland would never join them. And dreaming of a French SSR joining in union with Russia was just a fantasy. And as Russia moved forward, Stalin's opinion was going to count for a lot more than Lenin's. Because though Lenin's influence and authority would never be questioned, he was already ailing and his powers waning. As we will discuss in great detail next week, the future course of Russia, the Soviet Union, and global socialist revolution would not be guided by Lenin, but by Stalin and Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. The principal opponent of Stalin's model of the RSFSR, but for everybody, was a guy called Christian Rakovsky, an ethnically Bulgarian communist, a close ally of Trotsky, and presently head of government for the Ukrainian SSR. Rakovsky wanted the loosest possible federation as the surest possible survival for the revolution. No amount of legalese, in his opinion, could cover the obvious reality that Russia was redawning its imperial mantle. That was not going to go over well here in Ukraine. But Stalin and his allies waited until Rakovsky was literally off on a holiday to have the commission created by the Communist Party to recommend an integration plan approve the model of a single unitary state with, of course, mechanisms for internal autonomy. In December 1922, representatives of the four SSRs in question came together to unify politically. And though the other nationalities of the old Russian Empire were not afforded the elevated status of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Transcaucasus, the treaty those four nominally independent republics were about to sign fully anticipated more Soviet socialist republics joining after this initial core came together. And indeed, it would soon grow to encompass 15 such republics by the beginning of World War II. The treaty creating the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was approved on December 30, 1922, and it created a whole new federal government whose primary functions were indeed centralized in Moscow and in practice very little changed in terms of personnel or policy. Most of the governmental positions of the new Soviet Union were assigned by doling out new titles to the leaders of Soviet Russia. So Lenin ceased to be chairman of the RSFSR's Council of People's Commissars and instead became chairman of the Union's Council of People's Commissars. The only thing that changed is how much more authority he had and how much of a larger area it extended over. Meanwhile, the Russian Communist Party became the All-Union Communist Party, with again virtually no changes for anyone inside the inner circle of power. So, while Lenin and the Russian communists took great pains to make this all legally a union of co-equals, the Russians would always be, like Augustus, the first among equals. In declaring their new union to the world, the treaty creating the Soviet Union began with a short preamble, which read, Since the foundation of the Soviet republics, the states of the world have been divided into two camps, the camp of capitalism and the camp of socialism. There, in the camp of capitalism, national hate and inequality, colonial slavery and chauvinism, national oppression and massacres, brutalities and imperialistic wars. Here, in the camp of socialism, reciprocal confidence and peace, national liberty and equality, the pacific coexistence and fraternal collaboration of peoples. Which all sounds very nice, if it were, you know, true but it doesn't exactly read like an honest depiction of the material that I've had to cover for the last 20 or 25 episodes of this series. They said, though, that they expected the Soviet Union to be a model for harmony among the nations of the world. The preamble said, The bourgeoisie has proven itself incapable of realizing a harmonious collaboration of the peoples. It is only in the camp of the Soviets, only under the conditions of the dictatorship of the proletariat, that has grouped around itself the majority of the people, 
that it has been possible to eliminate the oppression of nationalities, to create an atmosphere of mutual confidence, and to establish the basis of a fraternal collaboration of peoples. It is only thanks to these circumstances that the Soviet republics have succeeded in repulsing the imperialist attacks both internally and externally. They also announced that the Union would provide a firm basis for economic reconstruction. The years of war have not passed without leaving their trace, it read. The devastated fields, the closed factories, the forces of production destroyed, and the economic resources exhausted. This heritage of the war renders insufficient the isolated economic efforts of the several republics. National economic reestablishment is impossible as long as the republics remain separated. I mean, how else was Russia going to rebuild itself if it wasn't fed by Ukrainian wheat? The preamble ended by saying, All these considerations incessantly demand the union of the Soviet republics into one federated state capable of guaranteeing external security, economic prosperity internally, and the free national development of peoples. The will of the peoples of the Soviet republics recently assembled in Congress, where they decided unanimously to form the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, is a sure guarantee that this union is a free federation of people equal in rights, that the right to freely withdraw from the union is assured to each republic, that access to the union is open to all republics already existing, as well as those who may be born in the future, that the new federal state will be the worthy crowning of the principles laid down as early as October 1917, of the pacific coexistence and fraternal collaboration of peoples, that it will serve as a bulwark against the capitalist world and mark a new decisive step towards the union of workers of all countries in one worldwide socialist Soviet republic. So we're really approaching the end of the line here. It's been five years since the Russian Empire collapsed in 1917, and from the remnants of that collapsed heap, we now have the Soviet Union being born here in December 1922, a union that would be the political manifestation of revolutionary communism in Eastern Europe for the next 70-odd years, until the member states finally took the text up on this declared right to withdraw from the union at any time. But as the Soviet Union was born, the leader, who more than any other single person had brought it into existence, was dying. By the time this treaty was signed in late 1922, Lenin had already suffered the first of several strokes that would first incapacitate him and then kill him. So next week, Lenin's long history of stormy agitation and hyper-rigid, workaholic revolutionary activity will finally catch up with him. But I promise I won't let him just disappear without allowing him to trash-talk everyone who might possibly succeed him. (laughs) 